Okay. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's live stream presentation, Chronic Wasting Disease in Elk Populations, with Dr. Will Janicek, but he's a biologist with the USGS. I am Kristen O'Hara, Director of Interpretation at Pajarito Environmental Education Center, uh, or PEAK as it's lovingly called. We are located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. I'm the moderator for tonight's talk. Hello. Of course, a little bit about PEAK before we get started. We are the nonprofit that operates the Los Alamos Nature Center. Visit our website, peecnature.org, to, learn more, about, to more, learn more about the Nature Center and some of our upcoming events. I would like to give a quick shout out to our wonderful members, donors, volunteers, and staff who really make everything we do possible. To learn more about be becoming a donor or member, please visit our website, peecnature.org. Okay, just a few logistics before we get started. Um, this is, of course, a live stream presentation. Our presenter will be taking questions via Zoom chat and will be answering those questions at the end of his presentation. And now to the good part. Um, I'm going to do a little bio pre uh, info intro for Will, and then he will take over. Dr. Will Janicek has been a biologist at U U USGS sorry, for the last four years. He has degrees in the fields of disease ecology and wildlife bio biology from the University of Montana, UC Santa Cruz, and Kansas State University. Currently, Will works on a range of ecological questions, including assessing the population status of pollinators like the Western bumblebee. We have a great talk recorded from him about that. He also tracks trends in mountain goats and grizzly bears in Glacier National Park and studies the way elk interact to inform chronic wasting disease management by brain stalled. And without further ado, I thank you all for being here with us tonight, and I will hand the mic over to Will to get started. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to swap sides here. So, um, and, and thanks for having me. I, you know, today we're going to talk a little bit about chronic wasting disease and a little bit about elk populations and some specific, I guess we'll call them case studies, uh, work that I've been doing um, along with other collaborators in USGS and uh, National Park Service, um, State of Wyoming, Fish and Wildlife Service um, on the National Elk Refuge in Wyoming. Um, I wanted to uh, talk briefly and kind of broadly here about some background terminology that we, we've, you might've heard, especially in the last few years, when we have, uh, you know, been enduring the uh, coronavirus um, pandemic. Um, so I wanted to cover some of these, these key terms. You'll hear them again in the talk, um, but I thought it was important to kind of give a broad overview of basic disease ecology terms. So pathogen, that is um, the disease causing agent. Um, those are the viruses, the bacteria, the fungi, parasites even. Um, and as we'll talk about today, proteins that cause disease. And then hosts are those things that those pathogens infect, um, organisms that are infected by the pathogen. We are hosts in the pandemic currently. Disease is really the manifestation of the pathogen's effects on us. So you have a pathogen um, that infects a host and that leads to some form of symptoms, temperature, sneezing, you know, anything that you might think of here. That illness is the disease itself. That's the manifestation of the pathogen of the infection um, of the pathogen. Transmission is that process where we have um, pathogen spread. And there's a couple different modes of transmission. Um, we'll refer to those as both direct transmission, that's like person to person, host to host directly, um, but also indirect transmission where an individual, a host may leave the pathogen on a doorknob or in the environment in some way and then that is picked up. So that'd be an indirect transmission. And many diseases can occur in both of these, some only in, only in one direction. Um, chronic wasting disease is one that we'll talk about that can potentially occur in both directions. And then prevalence. So this is the proportion of disease in a population. You have some amount of transmission that occurs. Here we have green infected individuals, yellow um, non-infected. Um, and so in a population of 10, when you have six infected, those are, um, that's a 60% prevalence rate. Um, so when we're talking about disease, 
host behavior is really important aspect and large aggregations of hosts oftentimes can influence transmission and prevalence. And we see this across different types of species, across different life stages and across different pathogen types. And so whether we're talking about fungal pathogens, you might've heard um, in recent years about chytridiomycosis, the fungal pathogen that has been killing a lot of amphibians, um, bacterial infections like tularemia in mammals, and even viral infections such as West Nile virus in uh, avian hosts. Um, the aggregation of these species and, and individuals within those groups can really influence how um, transmission can occur. And oftentimes we think about that in terms of direct transmission, the more aggregated um, a group of hosts are, the more likely you might have that direct transmission because individuals are in contact with each other more readily. Um, but how hosts interact with their environment can also influence pathogen transmission. And a, and a variety of pathogens can be in, transmitted indirectly through that process. Um, we're talking about chronic wasting disease today, but I wanted to kind of bring that up first in this example of anthrax, because they have a nice, this paper Gantz et al. has a nice figure of how that can occur. So anthrax is a bacterial uh, infection, but um, when you have a, a host that dies and leaches that, uh, that pathogen into the soil that can then be taken up by roots of other plants and then ingested by other hosts. And we see something similar that's possible with um, chronic wasting disease. And so you can have this kind of indirect transmission where hosts aren't actually contacting each other, they're only contacting uh, a contaminated environment. So we call this indirect transmission because it's not direct from host to host. So what is chronic wasting disease? Well, it's, it's a fatal neurological disease. Um, and it's caused by a prion, which is a misfolded protein. And it's kind of an interesting um, pathogen in that it's, it's not um, what we would typically think of as an infectious agent, like a virus or a bacteria. Um, in particular, chronic wasting disease affects individuals of the deer family. So that's primarily deer and elk, but we've also seen it in small occasions, small all occurrences in as well. Um, and so it affects the neurological pathways, um, the behavior of animals. It creates a lot of weight loss, um, erratic behavior. Sometimes at really late stages, you might see animals like walking in circles, things like that, broad thing in the mouth a little bit. Um, this photo on the right shows an elk that is infected with chronic wasting disease. You can see that it's a bit emaciated. Um, if this was a video, you would see they probably had trouble walking. Um, those are some of the typical symptoms. Um, and then clinically, the slide here in the middle shows the degeneration of the brain tissue that follows these types of spongiform um, encephalopathy, which is a hard word to say and I have it on the next slide. I've been practicing it, but you see this deterioration of the neurological tissues um, that leads to these other symptoms. So prions are interesting in that we have pr proteins in our body all the time, but they're misfolded and they cause these kind of malfunctions. So we also see other types of prion diseases, and you might be familiar with some of these. I just wanted to mention them. So bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSC, also called mad cow disease, is a type of prion that, uh, disease that only infects uh, cows. Um, scrapie is a popular one in sheep and goats, if you've heard of that one before, that affects those types of animals. Um, there's a version of this that occurs in humans, grutzfeldt jacob disease, and then also a variant of that um, that is a, a variant of the same type of protein that might, that causes mad cow disease has um, had some cases in humans. It's really rare um, to show up in human populations, um, but it is possible. So I wanted to highlight that. So there's kind of a long story, long history arc of chronic wasting disease um, in North America. And we really first started to see cases um, or evidence first observed in captive facilities in Colorado. This is the late 1960s, and these were um, captive deer, but it took a while, about another 15 years or so, um, for the first animals in the wild to show symptoms or to be found and that would tested and found positive with chronic wasting disease. So 1981, first wild elk in, in Colorado. We gotta jump a little bit 10 years forward. We, start to see more reporting, the testing's happening now at kind of a county level in Colorado and Wyoming, and you're finding um, instances of the disease in parts of, I would say Northwestern, we'll see a map in a second, but Northwestern Colorado, Southern Wyoming. 
by 2000, another 10 years or so, fighting in Oklahoma, Nebraska. By 2012 now, we're up to a number of more states in the Midwest um, and also in the Mountain West there, New Mexico, Utah, um, all the way out east as, as Pennsylvania. And now we're 2023, we're in 30 US states um, and three Canadian provinces. So here's what that looks like spatially. There's a lot going on here um, on this map and we'll walk through it. This, this map is available on a USGS website. Um, it's created by the National Wildlife Health Center and it's updated fairly regularly um, as new counties and new information comes up. Um, so this map is from March 3rd. So about a month old now. Um, we'll start with the, the polygons, which these are counties, these shaded gray areas. Um, the ones that are this light gray color, this is where we have chronic wasting disease and free ranging ungulate populations. So deer and elk primarily, some moose, but that's rare. Um, we're talking mostly about deer and elk here in this light gray colors. Um, I might pop on my laser print here just to get this a little bit better. So this dark gray shows those initial counties prior to 2000 where this uh, chronic wasting disease was present in the wild and wild populations. And then the yellow and the red dots are captive facilities where chronic wasting disease was either present and, and those had been depopulated or present in those, those captive facilities are currently occupied. My agency and myself, we don't work on that side of things in terms of the captive breeding facilities, and that's all uh, monitored and regulated by the USDA. Um, so I don't have as much information to talk about with those. We're focused mostly on the free ranging side of things for this talk. But you can see the expanse of the spread of chronic wasting disease. I live up here in Missoula, Montana. We've been slowly adding counties um, every year, uh, kind of getting it coming down from Canada and up from Wyoming, kind of both directions. Um, then I think the newest uh, county, if I recall, is this one here in Alabama, a few others in Mississippi that were added more recently. Um, so spread is sort of moving into the south east as well. Um, and then here, which I have on the next map, shows you a couple of the counties where uh, chronic wasting diseases have been found in uh, New Mexico. So pull in a little bit tighter for New Mexico. So testing in New Mexico has been going on since the 1990s, um, actually since 1990s, so throughout the 1990s. Uh, first confirmed case was in 2002 in White Sands Missile Range. Um, that was, I believe, a mule deer. Um, it's found in both deer and elk um, in the state. And 59 detections um, as of 2018. Um, that's the most recent data I was able to find for the state. I wanted to provide you with some numbers to give you a, a picture. Um, 59 detections as of January 2019 or 2018, since 1990 though. So that's not as many per year as you might find in other places like Wyoming um, or even uh, parts of the Midwest. If you're interested in learning about these, uh, about the testing that's happening and the, and the results from that and other information about chronic wasting disease in New Mexico specifically, uh, I, this website here goes to your state, uh, your state website, uh, wildlife.state.nm.us. And this has all of this factual information there, plus other information about the testing that's taking place. Why should we care about chronic wasting disease and ungulates? And like, what's the big deal here? Well, ungulates provide a lot of uh, resources, both for uh, the ecosystem. They can shape habitat by the way that they browse woody vegetation and increase forb diversity. Um, they can also provide food for other wildlife um, and there is a strong economic and cultural uh, connection uh, to, uh, to us um, through those animals. So 9 million big game hunters in the US um, contribute about $15 billion annually. That's based on census data from the US um, Department of Interior. This, this quote, uh, this value was since 2016. And I'm sure there's more recent um, studies coming out. I think the newest census comes out this next year. They're currently doing it to kind of check and see what the current numbers are. But that was as, 20, as of 2016. Um, so there's both this kind of ecological relationship underpinning the uh, importance of ungulates, deer and elk and others in ecosystems, and then the added benefit of 
the, the cultural ties that we have um, to those resources. So today I'm talking about a couple of recent projects um, on the National Elk Refuge. And really we're, this is a unique part of the country because this is um, an area of uh, Western Wyoming where chronic wasting disease just started to show up. Um, but there are some, some aspects that might cause, uh, I guess, concern for future disease spread. And one of them is this kind of background picture you see here is the, the wintering elk um, on the Jackson Elk Refuge. And so the wintering elk are part of a larger herd called the Jackson Elk Herd that exists in Western Wyoming, north of Jackson, Wyoming. Um, some of them range um, during the more summer months all the way up into Yellowstone. Um, so if you've heard about the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, there's elk are a very uh, prominent part of that ecosystem as well. Um, but it's a very large herd and they have a historical wintering ground um, on the National Elk Refuge. And so there's management related to that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And so we work as a federal agency, USGS, we work and partner with our sister agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service to help um, understand and conduct studies about management practices, to think about um, potential um, benefits, uh, things to do in the future, to understand population change, um, and to better understand the ecology of these species. And so we've been working on a few different projects. The first is looking at the drivers of contact rates of wintering elk. So what are the uh, factors that can influence how aggregated elk get? Contact rate is a simple way of talking about um, the proportion of time individuals spend near each other in space. Um, so when contact rates go up, diseases that can spread directly um, can increase in, in prevalence. Um, Contacts rate go down, animals spread out, could be beneficial to reducing disease spread. We've also been working on a few different innovative approaches to measuring changes in aggregation, um, thinking about ways to gather data more efficiently and also different types of metrics that we can use to um, better assess aggregation uh, at kind of the landscape scale. And then finally, I'll briefly talk a little bit about some adaptive management approaches. We'll talk about what that term means um, to reducing aggregation, specifically in this population, uh, the Jackson elk herd. So as I mentioned before, we're working with this, with this uh, on the National Elk Refuge, which is just north of Jackson, Wyoming. And this is the historical wintering ground for the Jackson elk herd. Uh, this refuge really came about during the development of Jackson, Wyoming in the early 1900s. So they began to feed the elk in the wintertime um, starting in 1908 before the refuge was founded, but then shortly afterwards, the refuge was created there. And, and so the feeding was really done to uh, reduce winter elk mortality. In the early 1900s, there were some very severe winters. And because, as I mentioned about that cultural and economic connection, to these animals, um, there was uh, the practice of feeding was started to help reduce that, that winter mortality to keep those animals alive. But then at the same time, in those harsh winters, they noticed that the elk would wander into areas where livestock were, where farmers had their, or ranchers had their hay resources out for their livestock. Um, and so the elk were eating that hay, which was causing um, conflict. And so to reduce that conflict and to at the same time increase winter survival, the feeding was started on, um, on the refuge. There's a really nice um, bison, the bison are also there, I'll mention that as much as elk. Um, and there's a nice management plan that they've, that they produced, um, the bison elk management plan that was um, published in 2019. And you can download that online and, and read about the history of the refuge, but also the, the population size and structure and the, and the uh, changes in management over time. So naturally, though, we think about we're feeding animals, possibly creating an artificial resource, you know, increasing the aggregation. And so that creates concern about the potential for chronic wasting disease. And I mentioned before that that um, has shown up in the western half of the state. If we look back at that map, you'll see some counties in the west that have um, positive cases. We've only had one case in one elk um, in this part of the state. 
and that was in 2020. There's been heavy testing and consistent testing since that time and no, uh, no other positive cases. Is it present? We found one case, so should be present, but at low enough levels that we're not detecting it um, at, in any regularity. Um, but there's also other diseases that are, are important too, brucellosis being one of the more prominent ones. Um, brucellosis is a bacterial infection that can affect a lot of different types of livestock, cows, sheep, um, also humans at times, um, and elk, and that causes uh, pregnant elk to uh, abort their fetus. So um, that's of concern as well. Not something I'll talk about anymore today. Just wanted to put that in your picture that this aggregation isn't important just for transmission of one specific type of disease, but we think about it um, kind of collectively. I wanted to show the seasonal elk movements, um, just a little bit to give you some perspective of how far these animals are going from and where they're coming to. So Jackson is right down here. The refuge is just north of it. Each one of these colored dots is an animal that has a GPS, an elk that has a GPS collar on. And so this is over. Um, we're starting in like November, October, and moving into December now, and they start to come down. You'll see them start to aggregate on the refuge. A couple of them in a smaller herd outside of the refuge here, hanging out, doing their thing, moving around. Eventually, they'll make their way over here starting in uh, late February or early March. They'll start to come on over. But that just shows you about, you know, they're coming from a, a wide ranging area during the more fall summer months and moving, migrating down to the elk refuge. Um, which is, you know, you can see here based on the topography, uh, a lowland area, historically more grassland, more vegetation in the wintertime um, for them to uh, feed on. And then they go back out to their respective areas in the summertime. I'll let this play through one more time. I think we've got time and I think it's just interesting to kind of pick one and watch. Some of these make fairly large jumps in movement per day and some of them are moving a little bit smaller having more localized area. But eventually they all kind of find their way down to the refuge here. And so once they arrive at the refuge, they pretty much spend the entire winter there. They don't leave or go off refuge very far. They're hanging out here. Um, and it's not until we start to see uh, the spring melt take place um, when we start to see them leave, leave the refuge. And that's typically in, in, in late May. So to put that in perspective, like I, I've been describing this kind of large herd of animals and I just wanted to give you some perspective, like how does this compare to other elk populations and where's our level of concern at? So, um, there was a study done in 2014 that looked at some elk densities in Colorado outside Rocky Mountain National Park in that area. And they typically see per square kilometer between 15 and 100 elk, around 110 elk per square kilometer. And chronic wasting disease showed up in that population. And at that level of density, they found about a 13% prevalence rate, which means um, that's a little over one in 10, right? 13%. So about one in 10 elk plus or minus was positive with CWD. And at that level of prevalence, they saw declines in the population. When we look at NER, the National Elk Refuge, we have densities where we have about 1,000, 1,100 elk per square kilometer. That's 10 to 70 times higher density than what I showed you in that previous, uh, that previous study. And so there's expectation that um, over time, as chronic wasting disease enters that system, um, that there could be a highly uh, high potential for negative impacts from the from that disease. That prevalence could be higher than what we would see in other populations that are lower density. And so I've mentioned these two different pathways: one of uh, direct host contact, um, host to host, that leads to pathogen transmission, and then the one of indirect contact, where you have hosts interacting with the environment depositing the prion in the environment, and then another host interacting with that contaminated environment. Those can be both driven by host aggregation. And what we're interested in, and what I'm gonna talk about is kind of the factors that influence space use and influence host aggregation. And that can be a range of factors, including supplemental feeding, which we'll talk about, creating that artificial aggregated resource, uh, predation risk. So the, predator of a prevence, uh, the, the presence of a predator can influence uh, movement of individuals, they might group up together to be in a protective posture from predators. Weather conditions can affect 
uh, movement, both from an energetic cost perspective. Sometimes if snow depth gets very, if snow gets very deep, animals will move less, elk will move less um, once it reaches a certain depth. Um, and then forage availability. So just the natural variation in forage across the landscape can cause aggregation in those areas. And so our purpose is to, to really examine and quantify the, the abiotic factors. So those non, um, the like climate or weather, those are our abiotic factors, how those can influence aggregation versus what we would call the management effects, which is the actual practice of feeding. And this background image here is an aerial imagery, a drone imagery um, that shows elk on the feed lines. And I think it's no surprise that if you were to go out during the feeding time to say, yeah, look, feeding aggregates elk. But we wanted to quantify it so we could better understand and make predictions about what would happen if we stopped feeding or slowly end feeding, right? And so to do that in a quantifiable way, we need to compare um, the influence of feeding that you see here, and then things like snowfall, temperature, and those other factors, hunting pressure. Just for reference, like these lines are the feed lines and the elk will walk along those. Each elk here, um, based on the, 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 the size of an elk, this is about an 800 meter by 800 meter image, uh, maybe a little bit longer on the bottom just because it's wide angle. Uh, but there's quite a few elk here, as you can see. So we looked at, um, data from 68 elk that were GPS collared as a, as a representation of, of the population on the refuge. At this time, they're fairly aggregated. You know, it's a, not a huge area. So this number of elk um, collared is, is, is a pretty good number, a little over 220,000 individual relocations or, or specific GPS coordinates from those elk over these three years. And interestingly, we have um, three years two with feeding and then one without. This was the year that they chose not to feed on the refuge was a, a year of really low snow um, and uh, low winter severity overall, and they chose not to feed. And it actually provides us um, with a unique um, comparative in a way experiment um, to look at what the patterns of aggregation over the course of the winter look like in a year that they didn't feed compared to sort of the baseline strategy, the baseline feeding strategy. And so I'm going to show you results from two of these years. We're going to look at the 2018, um, 2017, 2018 winter of no feeding, and then show the, the, the next year, the 2018, 2019 winter of feeding. And what those years really talking, we're talking about the, the overwinter. So it's, it's fall of 2018 to spring of 2019 when, when that comes up. So here is um, a figure showing contact rate um, by date from uh, 2017 to 2018, so 2017 December into 2018 of May. Our contact rate, again, this is our proportion of time two individuals spend together. Um, so the black line here is what we observed from the GPS caller data. The red line is what we modeled that rate to be based on the factors um, that we considered, weather, hunting, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But just to show you like the fact that the model aligns well with the observed data um, makes us feel like we have a, a fairly good predictive model here. Um, so what you'll first want to point out here is the contact rate kind of gradually goes up and then comes down um, in late spring. Part of this um, follows, especially on the tail end, follows the reduction in snow cover. As snow cover starts to decline, we see a gradual um, decline in, in, in contact rate. So the aggregation decreases, animals are starting to spread out as more vegetation becomes available in the early spring, late winter time period. Um, I should mention, so this y-axis here goes from zero to one, um, and it, it, both me, it, it both covers our uh, contact rate. So a contact rate of about, let's say 0.25, means that on average, any two given individuals will spend 25% of the day together. So this is daily contact rate. Um, we're a little below that. We're actually about at 0.15, 1, 13 as an average. Um, so in a non-fed year, the average contact rate over the course of the season is about 13%. So two individuals spend about 13% of the day together in a non-fed year. We also looked at the effects of hunting, which happens on, on the refuge on the early, uh, early side of our time frame, just happens late, uh, late fall 
early winter. And during this time, we actually have a suppression of the contact rate because the hunting pressure spreads animals out. Um, but it occurs at a fairly small window during the, during the winter season. And we also looked at temperature and snow depth, but for simplicity, I'm gonna just keep it to these three variables. Fractional snow covered area or the percent of area that was covered in snow on the refuge um, tops out in the 80% this year and, and trails off there down to about 25% of the area as we hit May. Um, this snow covered variable was our most important abiotic factor um, in driving aggregation. Okay, so here is when we add feeding to the mix. So we have similar relationships to fractional snow covered area, as I mentioned, um, but it's fairly obvious here when you have this window of feeding, this is the gray shaded area, you see this strong jump in, um, in the contact rate, almost up to 50% of the time. So any two, any two individuals spending about half of the day within close proximity to each other, within an area that we would consider in contact. And then um, once feeding ends, you see rapid decline in that aggregation and then a trailing off as the snow continues to melt. And so what we have here is a, is a, is a misalignment in a way with the natural cues. Um, and part of the management moving forward is thinking about how to align feeding practices better with those, uh, those abiotic triggers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what's taking place in the future on the refuge regarding to that. Um, we see the same influence that as hunting occurs on the refuge, we have a tendency to have a decline or depression in the contact rate. So hunting spreads animals out. Um, and I think that's about all I wanna say here, just to show you that relationship in, in feeding, uh, it's about twice as strong as any other predictor in aggregating the animals on the refuge. Um, but we still found a fairly strong influence of snow cover and so figuring out the interplay between the management practice and the uh, abiotic cues is really important when we consider management in the future. Here's a little bit simpler way to think about these figures. You were lost in that, like, don't worry. I stumbled through it too sometimes thinking about all these different little intricacies that are happening. So I wanted to show you this just to give a little bit more reference. So um, hunting is our only factor that we found that spread animals out increases in, in hunting pressure, spread the animals out, that meant less contact, less interaction. Supplemental feeding was our strongest influence of aggregating those animals, but we also found positive influence of snow cover and minimum temperature, as well as snow depth too, in increasing that aggregation. So animals tended to be more, more in contact, more aggregated. Um, the longer feeding took place, uh, the more of the area that was covered in snow and the colder um, that it was. So we're developing some new methods as well now to start to think about measuring aggregation on the refuge. Um, but also this, these tools and approaches are applicable across populations and across species um, and doesn't have to do with uh, chronic wasting disease and elk. You can use these methods on a variety of uh, taxa from birds to bats to even bumblebees if you wanted to, maybe not satellite imagery, that'd be hard to see be from there. But um, we're, we're using our work on the refuge to kind of help develop these, um, these methodologies and um, working to make them broadly applicable. Um, but one of the first things that we've done here is, is look at these different imaging sources um, in relation to what I showed you previously was a study that used GPS collar data uh, which is a little bit more time intensive to get. So you have to capture an animal. Um, you have to put the collars on the animals. That takes time. You, the collar will record data. Oftentimes we'll stream that to a satellite and bounce it back to the to a server. Um, you have to analyze that data. All that kind of takes time. Um, and the collars are, are kind of costly. Uh, other resources though that can get you similar information but maybe slightly different is satellite imagery. This is an example of a satellite image from the refuge of a white background, which is the snow cover. And then each one of these kind of brown smudges is an elk. And so what we can do is go and take, uh, take that satellite image. We know the locations of like, say the corners of the image. We can geo-reference that and then figure out the specific location each one of these elk is at, and then make our distance calculations, our contact rate calculations. 
So that's really coarse view. Um, takes an image of a, of, a, of a wider area. Alternative to that are UAS or unmanned aerial drone systems where we can fly drones around the landscape and get nice sharp images at times and then other times less so sharp images. That really depends on the, the type of uh, drone that you're using. Um, but we can then do the same thing. We can geo-reference the figure and take the locations of these individual animals and assess aggregation that way. Um, satellite imagery works less well on brown background just because of the level of detail we can get. Um, but we can start to do that a little bit in the non-snowy time periods with elk as well. Um, oftentimes it's easier to spot the shadows of the animals than it is to, to see them themselves in these types of photos. So we're looking at a lot of different types of metrics, both ones that are measures of the space use of animals. So we'll call those kernel density estimates. They create these polygons when we analyze the data. This is, a, a, um, this is essentially the refuge. Um, and each one of these little tiny black dots is a location of an animal. And from that in information, we can draw these polygons of use and sort of map out where those animals are using the refuge. And we're talking about a pathogen that's potentially transmissible through the environment. And so if you want to uh, maybe control for that contamination or know places that might be more highly contaminated than others, this is a, a, a useful tool to to visualize spatially where the where those aggregations are. Um, but we're also looking at things like inter-animal distance, just a raw measure of how far apart those animals are. And we're finding that we can use all of those different types of imagery systems um, to make those same kind of assessments, um, to make these kind of um, aggregation metrics uh, usable across different um, study areas and across different uh, study species. And really what that then is providing managers with a much broader tool set based on their budgets in their questions and information needs to, to potentially provide lower cost um, information than say the GPS callers um, and getting a similar result as snapshots of density through space. And so this is kind of a new field uh, especially the drone imagery, like that's becoming more popular over the last few years and how we use that in our, um, our daily studies. So currently the National Elk Refuge has published a step-down plan in regarding feeding on the refuge. Um, and um, over time, they're working at slowly uh, shortening the feeding window, um, but other parts that have come to discussion about how you might change the intensity of the winter feeding, um, spreading the feed out more, potentially because we found that strong effect of hunting in the early, early winter, late fall. How can you use hunting as a management tool to, to reduce aggregation? Um, and so that process is underway. There's some documents that are available online to read about the step-down plan and, and the future decisions. But um, what we're working with the refuge on right now um, and this is sort of just the teaser for future references is, is working through this adaptive management framework of that step down in feeding. And so adaptive management is, uh, um, it's a cyclical management framework. And so instead of just doing a one-off management action um, to be successful or to, I guess, uh, more readily ensure success, you wanna be, uh, you wanna do it in a way that you can evaluate it and then adjust from there. So that's really what uh, adaptive management is at its core. Um, it's been, I think, simply defined as learning by doing. And so we are working through the evaluation process of this initial implementation of a step-down plan. That was initiated in 2020 and has been taking place now for a couple of winters. And so we're at this stage of the evaluation, um, which evaluating the actions of shortening the feeding window and how are the animals responding? How is aggregation changing? Um, and then um, depending on the outcome of that um, management, um, how those actions are meeting the management goals can influence future action. But the main goals here of our partners, which is predominantly Fish and Wildlife Service in consultation with the state Fish and Game of Wyoming and in collaboration with the National Park Service is to reduce that interaction between elk because we know that chronic, chronic wasting disease can be spread through direct contact, um, keeping an eye on that. But at the same time, thinking about how we can reduce the potential for environmental transmission by spreading out the areas of use 
um, and reducing that, that strong contamination. As I wrap up here, I wanted to mention um, some resources, really one in particular that I think is great um, uh, because it kind of encapsulates a bunch of other resources that then you can access through this site. So this is the CIDREP. This is the Centers for Infectious Disease Research and Policy out of the University of uh, Minnesota. And they have uh, resource news and current events for a variety of diseases from chronic wasting disease to COVID-19 to adenoviruses and all sorts of stuff. Zika, I guess the A to Z of the, of the diseases. Um, and this is a snapshot of the, uh, of the webpage and they have a variety of things you can learn about. This webinar was actually posted uh, under their uh, webinars page for people to find out because it's open to the public. And so if you're interested in this topic and you wanna to find out more, this is a great resource. They have links to those maps that I showed you earlier, the USGS maps, as well as a bunch of other things. And then newsletters that you can get. Um, I think it's a monthly or maybe a weekly newsletter. I can't remember now, but um, that provide you with information happening at every, at every state. We're also working on sniffing uh, dogs, being able to sniff out chronic wasting disease in the field, which there's an article on that website about, which is quite interesting, um, and some of the new tools. So the CID rep, rep website is great. Um, and there are uh, websites, uh, like so the CDC has websites about, um, about chronic wasting disease as well, and kind of how you should think about um, its impact on your life potentially in the future. Also a great resource. So with that, I'll say thank you. Um, I've mentioned a couple of different publications that my, my uh, myself and my collaborators have published in recent years, um, spoke, focused specifically on some of the work that we talked about today. Um, this one here, Human Activities and Weather Drive Contact Rates of Wintering Elk, um, and then uh, Eyes on the Herd, um, using those different types of imagery data to, to look at uh, ways of aggregation, uh, ways of measuring aggregation. Um, and those are available online. Um, online as well. And I'd be amiss to thank the many co-authors and partner agencies that have contributed to this work um, in, in the Mountain West. So thanks for listening and, and I'll try to answer your questions. All right. So um, we had one just come in around the dogs. I think I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can dogs get something equivalent to CWD? If so, how are they protected? Yeah, I don't know of any uh, example of that in this system. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't believe that's the case. Um, the ones that I've showed you uh, earlier were the main, the main ones, but I'm not aware of any prion diseases in, in canines. Um, certainly, there is no evidence at the current moment that this particular prion can transfer between like uh, deer and elk to humans or deer and elk to um, dogs. Um, Oh. So, yeah, not that I know of at this at this time. Got it. And I must have heard like I've I've read some information about this, and there's people concerned mm -hmm. that it's like um led to like early onset Alzheimer's and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But there's actually no yeah. correlation. There's no there's no there's been no definitive link from from the from chronic wasting disease to humans. There's I mean there's it's an area of 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 ongoing, I think, accelerating research to understand what it would take for that to occur. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think the best thing for folks to consider is what, you know, is to follow CDC guidelines and they suggest not to eat meat that might be contaminated with chronic wasting disease. They suggest to have animals that you might hunt to be tested. And I'm sure most state agencies are willing and, and happy to, to take samples of game that people um, bring home because and I actually don't know. I mean, you have to check your local state regulations because I'm sure in some states you might be required to submit sampling and others maybe not, but like it's voluntary, but um, it's a good thing to do. Certainly CDC suggests that and they, they suggest not to eat it, um, if it if it came back as having chronic wasting disease. The prion stays in the neurological system, like it's contained in the brain and the spinal cord and the spinal fluid. Um, so if you have contact with that, certainly be careful about. Um, yeah, but as far as I am aware, there's no, no linkage, but they are on like always studying ways that you could get a, I wouldn't want to call it a mutation, but a change in the prion that could then potentially inf infect humans. Because that occurs with uh, the uh, mad cow disease, the, the, the variant of Kreutzfeldt-Jacobs 
seemingly believe, is believed to be have come from mad cow in a variant of that, a mutation of that prion. So the, the possibility for the pathway exists, but there's been no demonstration of that at the, at the current moment. Got it. Yeah, thank you. It's it's fascinating. They're mm -hmm. fascinating. I mean, um, it's, you know, you can think about it like, like COVID-19 and like there's coronaviruses that occur in other species that we couldn't directly get, but a mutation in the virus then allowed us to be infected in that way. And right. So, it's still a possibilities, over but. For sure. Um, how are they managing animal herds uh, where they have had cases of chronic wasting disease? So the states are the primary uh, source for management. So I wouldn't want to speak to each one individually, but I would say generally, um, there are a lot of different ways to approach that. Mostly it's about reducing the aggregation, thinning down the population to reduce that uh, contact rate and to reduce the spread outside of an area that has infection. And so that in typically involves like focused hunts within a specific management zone to, to rapidly reduce the population. Um, increasing the number of tags per se um, within a, a very focused, fine, uh, delineated zone of where they have um, high amounts of transmission um, from their testing. Um, that's kind of been one of the main uh, sources of management um, because we know the strong direct transmission link um, for the disease. And so animals, are, elk and deer especially, are super migratory. Um, depending on which population we're talking about and where at in the Western US. And so like, if you can reduce population, limit the amount of animals leaving an area to go into a potentially a virgin territory where there is no chronic wasting disease, like that's one way of containment. Um, like mule deer for, I, had the, I wrote it down because I was fascinated by it today. So like the largest mule deer migration in the Western US is over 240 miles, one way. And so that's in, during fall migration in spring migration. And so you can imagine um, that can allow for um, chronic wasting disease to move across the landscape fairly quickly, just within a few years. Right, that's incredible. I didn't know mule deer did that, um, mm -hmm. at least not that far. Um, we'll just wait a second for anyone to ask any other questions they're curious about. I saw um, one come through about a study on macaques. I'm not well versed in the clinical trials so um, that one would be news to me if there's something more recent, but um, if there's a published study out there, I would encourage folks to read it for sure. Got it. So you might have received other questions that I haven't oh. because I'm sort of on the everyone. I just channel. saw it like pop up and go away. So I, while oh. we were talking. Okay, cool. We'll double check just in case um, they might've sent it directly to you. Yeah, that was a direct message. Yeah. I've, I've only vaguely heard about it, but I'm not like, I'm very much on the like broad scale management side of things like out in the field versus the, the clinical side. And so I'm not as, um, not as well-spoken about those, those topics or well-read. Is that what? The yeah, I think, you know, they, they're generally, I'll say like, they've been doing things in mouse models where they infect mice and see how it's transmissible and things like that. And then, um, I, I'm imagining that's what the macaque study is about is, um, doing some sort of lab infections to see can primates transmitted and things like that. But I'm not aware of the results of the study. Okay, cool. Thank you for clarifying. Um, it looks as of now, there's no questions coming through. So I'm just gonna um, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Uh, this is a, a really interesting subject and I hope our audience gleaned some perspectives on it. Yeah, um, I'm gonna go back to this slide just because I, I thought this was a really cool, is a really cool website and resource for folks if you haven't written it down or gone to it yet. Just because it has everything, it kind of uh, pulls in all the information from a lot of different resources, all the news that's kind of coming together. So uh, it's more of a one-stop shop for that. But if you go, instead of the backslash of chronic wasting disease, if you just go to the main website, the sidrap.umn.edu, and there's a, a drop down menu and it has A to Z different types of diseases and you can find out what's happening from mm. monkeypox and all the new stuff that you hear in the news. You can actually go and find um, good information about that and, and um, would encourage the encourage that investigation. So awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. It is an incredible resource. <laughs> Um, so it looks like no more questions coming through. So with that, again, thank you so much, Will. Um, thanks for joining us again for another talk. Uh, it's incredible. And
everyone who tuned in have a great evening and um we do have another peak talk coming up this friday which is the night skies in april if you're interested in finding out um what is happening in april all right awesome well thank you so much appreciate it thank you have a good evening you too have a good evening everyone